We have Seth God in here who was gracious and uh, courageous enough to explore this new video format. How you doing, Seth? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing really good. Are we catching you in your house? No, actually, this is my excuse for an office. Your excuse for an office. Okay. <laughs> This is kind of my excuse for an office too, but we won't have to give people a tour of our office. A hundred years ago, everything was dependent on who you knew and how much money you had. Yeah. And that where you were in an organization, the, the complete and total explanation of how much power you had, that your, your ability to influence the world was uh, set by the time you were 20, 25 years old, and that was the end of it. Now, uh, it's possible for anybody with access to a public library, which has an internet connection, to find and connect and lead dozens or hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people. Hmm. That it's possible, regardless of what you have in the bank, to create and spread an idea that influences people everywhere. So if we looked at marketing 50 or 100 years ago, marketing in those days was interrupting people who don't want to hear from you by sending money to media companies that would do that interrupting for you. And that structure rewards Procter & Gamble, and it rewards Hasbro Toys, or it rewards a major political party. But it punishes uh, passionate individuals. Mm -hmm. Now, the tables are turned. Now, Coca-Cola and Pepsi can't figure out how to reach us. But, you know, two kids in a dorm room in China can reach 20, 30, 40 million people all by themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, in fact, they do nothing after that is their choice. But take that platform, multiply it by the desire of people to hook up with each other and follow not the big leader, not the number one, but silos of people who share a passion. What we've discovered is just recently we've hit a massive shortage of leaders. And that the opportunity here, and this is where I think you get your part about no excuses, the opportunity is if you want to lead, if you care about where you're going, if you care about your ideas, you can do it. And you don't have to uh, say the system won't let you, because it will. The point is that if you want real world changing leadership, you have to care enough about an item, an object, a design, a mission, uh, a tribe, to push it through the dip to the other side. Uh -huh. And most people don't. I don't. I am the first person to become addicted to the next shiny object. I write too many books too often. I blog too often. If I just picked one idea and hammered it until everyone was bored with it, I pushed more people through that idea than if I just went on to the next one. Mm -hmm. And that's okay because I've managed to create a successful and profitable life out of the attention span that I do have. But if you want to make real world changing change, you're going to lead in a different way or you're going to have a partner who leads in a different way. And huh. that's one that pushes people through their resistance. You know, getting the first 20 people to join a group isn't particularly difficult. Yeah. Getting to 300 uh, is a little harder. What's fascinating is that when you get to 3,000, it starts growing itself. But so many people quit at 300 and go do the next thing, that we're constantly beginning new projects as opposed to pushing things through. Google was a failure for two years. How many of us, two years into it, would have said, oh, I got a great idea for a new social network? But, you know, to their credit, the three guys who went to Google said, we're just starting, and we're going to hunker down and keep pushing this idea further. Hmm. They augment it with other interesting things to catch their fancy, but they don't give up their core goal, which is to leave this idea where it needs to go. first thing to understand is we don't need more stuff. People, at least anyone who's got enough computer power to watch this, has enough stuff. <laughs> the economy was built in the last couple decades on buying stuff we didn't need. And in a retreat, in a recession, the first thing we're going to do is stop buying stuff we don't need. One of the reasons we were buying stuff we didn't need is to feel a sense of connection and belonging. Mm -hmm. to be part of a tribe by wearing the right outfit. And we're going to replace that stuff-based belonging with action-based belonging. Mm -hmm. That we're going to see more people join a bowling league or show up at a, a spiritual institution. We're going to see more people spending their time 
uh, connecting online or playing Scrabble because it is not only an acceptable substitute for going to the mall, but actually a better one. Uh, it's just harder to do. <laughs> so I think that there's a bigger opportunity now to step up and say, uh, you know, you, you 800 people who are going to go spend all this money on Super Bowl tickets, come to my bar instead. I got it on the big screen. You'll sit with a real person and we'll connect and we'll cheer on the Packers. And the opportunity to, st to stand up and be a leader of small groups it may not be profitable, not for many people, but it will lead you down a road that will eventually get you to where you want to be. And a simple example, uh, a guy sent me an email yesterday of uh, an amateur photographer who has devoted his retirement to writing the default newsletter for his little town. <laughs> so every day people get an email with pictures and articles and sports and sports and sports and everything that's going on in that town, at the school, at the local businesses, etc. And by the time the local paper comes out a week later, it's all old news. This guy, all by himself, now runs the town. And that opportunity, for free, is available to anybody. Being in the service business or the product business is not relevant. What's relevant is, are you in the leadership business? Are you in the business of connecting people to one another? Mm, mm -hmm. People will pay for things that make their lives better. They will certainly pay for things that make them money. So the reason that Google AdWords is less threatened than ABC is television commercials don't always pay for themselves. Google ads always do. You should run them until they don't work anymore. But you can measure that. <laughs> and so if you're in the service business and you can go to other businesses and say, I can make you money tomorrow, every one of those businesses will sign up if you can prove it. Yep. Right? You can't, however, make a living saying, I install overpriced granite countertops that people <laughs> want to show off to their friends. Because there's plenty of people who are finding cheaper ways to show off to their friends. I think that if you're doing marketing that costs money, you need to do live tests and measure repeatedly. Mm -hmm. So you don't buy $10,000 worth of Google Ads, you buy $100 worth. If you're going to launch a product, you don't have to launch it in every city. You launch it in one market and see what happens. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing something that's socially oriented, if you're doing something that's about experiences, if you're doing something that's about community, you can't test it because all the tests will be false. That everyone listens to Britney Spears because everyone listens to Britney Spears. And if you play Britney Spears to one person, they say, this is stupid. But teenagers listen to it because all the other teenagers are listening to it. The good news is this doesn't cost any money at all. It doesn't cost any money at all to go on Twitter and see if you can build a follow. It doesn't cost any money at all to start a blog and, and build your ideas up. It doesn't cost any money at all to start a meetup and see what happens when those people in the meetup work together, etc. So the opportunity going forward, if you're bootstrapping, is to do live tests that are basically launching. Figure out where the dip is, decide if it's worth pushing through the dip, and either make it work or walk away. <laughs> but it's so much cheaper today than it was five years ago. It doesn't matter if what you're selling works. People don't buy stuff because it works. They buy stuff because their boss wants them to. They buy stuff because the story matches their assignment. And if it works, then that adds to the story. If it works, then the story becomes true. If it works, then the story spreads. But you've got to start with the story. There are people who wake up every morning to say, my job is to get yet another training video from the HR department of my company. And if someone shows up making their job easier, they'll give you money. Mm. The problem is that you're telling a story to people whose worldview can't hear that story. Mm. And you need to find people who can hear the story and tell it to them in ways that they understand. Mm. And you need to look at the tools and the tactics and the means that you're using to tell those stories because that will lead to them having a conversation, giving you permission, learning enough, testing it, buying it, spreading the word beyond that. But the magic part is the story. Go back to the very first pages that Google posted. The story of Google was, there's three buttons, you won't screw it up. That was the story. They didn't say this is the most powerful search engine ever. They didn't say this, 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 this. They said, here's the simple story. If you're tired of screwing up search, you're tired of being confused, here's the answer.
Mm. And they told it to a whole bunch of people who needed to hear that story, who were open to the story. And that's the disconnect that so many small businesses make. Great question. Here's, here's the way that I look at it. There are two kinds of fears that I have to deal with. There's a kind of fear where I am honest with myself and I say, I don't want to go there. Right? Um, so, you know, I have a fear of riding a motorcycle. And I know I have a fear of riding a motorcycle. I don't see any upside of getting over that fear. So I set it aside. It's in a little box, motorcycle fear box, and I'm just not going to, I don't have time for that. <laughs> but then there are, there are other fears, fears where it's obvious that there's something on the other side of that fear. And I use the fear as a signal that I ought to be focusing an enormous amount of effort on it. Mm. Because there must be a reason why I don't want to do that. Uh -huh. And when I see one of those, there are many times where I'll examine it and discard it for non-fear related reasons. But I'm trying very hard, not successfully, but sometimes, to use fear as a signal to say this is a good this is a good place for me to go because there must be a reason why I don't want to go there. Thank you so much for your time, Seth. Cheers. Cheers.